Hi, it's Matthew Links, and welcome to this lecture, Beyond Resilience, Changing the Environment. I'm the uh, Professor of Medicine at Bond University and a visiting medical oncologist at Alice Springs and Icon Southport. And the talk today is part of a series on thriving and oncology that focuses on the workplace environment. So if we're talking about the organisational side of workplace stress, what options do you have for dealing with this? And I've listed some of them here. I'll give you a clue. The only one that really doesn't help is whinging. The, um, the others are all things that you can do within your control. And I particularly encourage you to think about advocacy as a way of dealing with organisational stress. So here's a picture of Stephen Bolton, who's a whistleblower from the Birmingham Children's Scandal. And he, through his advocacy, responded to a situation where children were literally dying the, um, and solved that problem. The, um, Don't get mad, get improving is the take home message from, from his experience. So the objectives for the talk today are first of all to understand the role of organisational stresses and your potential response, to understand the importance of advocacy in improving healthcare, to be able to apply some basic advocacy skills to improving your workplace, and to identify some strategies for saying no in order to advocate for yourself, and identify what you're going to do to advocate for your colleagues and create a better workplace culture. So this issue of how the resilience, workplace stress and well-being is imagined is a very contested one. And there's a major division in between those individual approaches to um, workplace stress, focus on meditation, resilience, etc., etc., and the organisational ones. So I was part of a group that uh, looked at the literature across both of those areas the end included oncologists, health workers, administration, and the organisational psychologists, try and have a more integrated model that pays due respect to both those aspects. And here's what we found. The um, uh, three models were particularly helpful in the literature. The first one was the demand resource model which says that workplace stress is a result of an imbalance in between demand and resources. And this has obvious implications for how we might respond. The second is the, uh, the insight that experienced stress is appraised. The, and by that, I mean that different people can make different judgments and have different experiences of the same environment. And the environment in which we work impacts upon how we assess and appraise stress. And the third model, which was important, is the that we learn how we to respond to stress. We can learn good habits or we can learn bad habits. And that learning occurs in practice. And our environment determines how we learn in practice. So all these three aspects of the environment are important the experience of workplace stress. So there's many different words, resilience, well-being, etc. I quite like the one from the castle, which is serenity, and particularly this uh, quotation from Reinhold Niebuhr, the, um, uh, which has been called the serenity prayer and adopted by Alcoholics Anonymous amongst other people. And that is about acceptance of things you can't change courage to change the things you can, and wisdom to know the difference. But the thing that's missing, I think, from this formulation of it is that changing things requires skill. And this is where your skill as a quality improver and as a productive, constructive team member plays its biggest part. Okay, well, let's think about these options of increasing resources or reducing demand. And 
there are limited sorts of possibilities. One, we can get bigger, and growth. One, we can work smarter, which is innovation. Or finally, we can set limits, the, um, which is very difficult to do in the oncology setting and underlies a lot of our workplace stress is that we know that setting limits on the delivery of care, quantity of care, the uh, uh, impacts on patients. Not setting limits, accepting everybody that comes through the door, the uh, irrespective of capacity has implications for quality. So this really brings us to the role of advocacy in dealing with these issues. And advocacy is an important part of the medical curriculum. To the left here, you can see the RACP curriculum wheel and health policy systems and advocacy is an important part of being a physician. Now, advocacy can be for yourself. It can be for the patient, for a service or for the community. And it's important to think about all these aspects of our role as physicians. Now, good strategy and good advocacy doesn't just happen. Some people who are very good at it are UNICEF, the, um, and I've taken this framework from their um, the from their uh, advocacy framework. The um, and the they asked nine questions the, um, that can help you plan an effective advocacy strategy. So the first you know, issue is really what do we want to happen? And being very clear about what you want to happen is important. So if the problem is the clinic running late, do you want it to run on time? Do you want to know what time it finishes? Do you want it to um, run, finish it on time on Wednesdays when you pick up the kids? You know, what do you really want and being able to clearly articulate that? In order to find a solution, you really have to understand how the system works and who can make change happen? And what's the pathway for escalating so that you can get the result you want? If the clinic running late's a problem, how do you what, uh, approach this in terms of the levers that you might have in order to lever change, leverage change? And one of them's the um, quadruple aim, it's about patient experience, the, about quality of care, about patient safety and about sustainability of the workforce. These are all concepts that you can take to the administration, you can take to your team leader, your supervisor, and talk the language that will leverage change. Also, you need to understand who could stop it happening, what evidence is going to support me, do you have evidence that the clinic's running over time, and who are the people who are on your side Perhaps the clerical staff want to get home time to maybe the patients uh, um, aren't happy about waiting. Who are your allies? So you might end up you know, working through this and coming to a meeting and the uh, good advocacy does depend upon some skills in approaching a meeting for change. So have the right people in the room, have a clear idea of what outcome you want and offer a solution. The, um, don't just complain, offer a solution anticipate what might go wrong and obviously prepare and present well. Okay, now I'd like to spend a little bit of time on the issue of advocating for yourself, which partly is about saying no. And Steve Jobs was one of the best, uh, most focused people um, on our planet and he really emphasised the importance of saying no to focus and prioritisation. Now this is pretty core cool business for us because saying no as an oncologist is core to good judgment. And if you don't, the, um, and there are oncologists who can't say no, and you can see what their practices are like. The, um, they spend all their time running around providing low value care. The, um, we have limited options for um, reducing the demand on our services, but good judgment is really a key one. So saying no, is a really important skill more generally. Now this is the most important uh, time management skill or principle that I ever learned. 
the um, and that is that if you're at 100 percent capacity something has to go before you can take on something new otherwise you're going to burst the um so think about it the uh, are you at 100 percent capacity the, uh, and if so and somebody wants you to do a you know research project or whatever what's going to go is it picking up the kids is it your exercise the um is it sleep the um uh, or is there some other way that you can create the capacity something else that can go and we really need to be able to make sustainable decisions about these things but just saying no and going to 120 percent doesn't work so saying no is not easy the um uh, particularly with the power imbalance as a um, trainee the um and of course if it is negotiable then there's some questions that you can ask yourself the um to help assess whether you should say no or not are you the best person for the job is it something you're interested in is it feasible do you have capacity is now the right time and when thinking about this think about your overall contribution am i pulling my wage am i over contributing more than i should the um or do i need to lift my contribution all those things are important so some tips be firm offer a lifeline like suggest an alternative or volunteer for a smaller commitment give yourself some time to make a good decision you might even practice saying no in front of the mirror if it's that hard or you're intimidated and provide some context for why you're saying no so here are some examples you can defer so can i have some time to think about this over the weekend and i have a look at what i'm already committed to or you could deflect Send me, can you send me some information about the project so I can have a think about it? A common uh, outcome of this is that they never send it to you, forget about it, and um, uh, you don't have to do anything. The, um, you can also try and prioritise and put it to them. I have to do a case presentation for Monday. I don't think I can do both. What would you like me to prioritise? The, um, you can delegate. The, um, I think this would be a great task for you know someone else. The, um, uh, and if you are saying no, defend, say sorry, I have to say no, but you know, I've got a new baby at home. The, um, um, but provide some defence. Okay, what about advocating for the organisation and reducing the stressor? Again, we've got some limited options. We can redesign the task, so we can make, you know, change the way we do clinic to work smarter. To a new patients at the beginning or on a Monday or whatever, the um, that makes the task work more efficiently. Or you can redesign the role. The um, maybe the advanced trainee role. You don't need to spend as much time on the ward now. There's a BPT, and that can be negotiated. Difficult uh, responses are reducing activity, the uh, or increasing resources. But I would highlight the, um, that there's a trade-off between quality and quantity. And if we are at 100% and we continue to squeeze in increased numbers, the quality is going to go down. The, um, and there's no leverage under those circumstances for extra resources. Increasing resources, getting an extra oncologist or extra re registrar, etc., is um, um, what we've traditionally do. We've grown, the, um, but there's limited capacity for uh, getting bigger. The, um, we really have to focus on those other aspects that are about getting smarter. Now, I'd like to spend some time on advocacy for each other, and that is really about creating a supportive environment at work as culture of support and learning. So how this culture is really created by us. As an advanced trainee, you are no longer the most junior person in the room. You are part of either the solution or the problem. The, um, so how do you contribute to making a better workplace culture? You can give support, certainly should seek support. It's helpful to learn what other team members can do for your patients and refer, develop those uh, skills in teamwork and don't ignore conflict. At the end of it, you want to be able to say that you're the most supportive person in the department 
if you offer that support, people will offer it back. And you'll, it'll be a good place to work. So taking that on board, what can you change? What's the most important thing you can do to improve the culture in your workplace? Have a think about that and then commit to doing it. The, um, it's a very rewarding process to make a positive contribution to your workplace. So to summarise, the biggest contribution to workplace stress in the modern healthcare system is the healthcare system. We create the culture, a culture of appraising difficult situations, its challenges, a learning culture where focus is on improvement and support. And there are things you can't change and there we really need to practice acceptance. But there are lots of things we can change and we need to be able to innovate and advocate for a better system through learning skills in advocacy, quality improvement, and appropriately saying no. So my challenge to you is be part of the solution. Good luck and thanks for your attention.